Il giusto Dio, quando i peccati nostri hanno di rimission passato il segno, a ciò che la giustizia sua dimostri, uguale alla pietà spesso dà regno, a tiranni atrocissimi e tamostri, a dar loro forza e di malfare ingegno. Welcome back to this series of videos dedicated to Orlando Furioso. The beginning of Canto 17 that I just read uh, sees Ariosto take a little bit of a political stance in a very Dantean way because he's alluding to some powerful people of history and also some powerful people of his times without ever really being very specific, which tells us that he's really referring to contemporaries. In particular, when he's talking about wolves in stanza number three and four, he's referring to bad politicians, bad powerful people, but also he's looking at the situation of Italy in his times, so fractured, not only fractured, but also constantly at the mercy of uh, foreign armies who would come down from the north, from the west, and uh, invade or make different battles and wars. In particular, he's thinking about uh, that time after the Battle of Ravenna, when Pope Julius II called the Swiss mercenaries to come from beyond the Alps. That's why in uh, the stanza 3 and 4 he says the beyond the mountains he mentioned he means the northern Alps, the crown of Italy. So the Swiss mercenary is to come in Italy and use Italy as a battleground, as a battlefield. The beginning of uh, stanza 4 goes like this. A cui non par cabbi a bastar lor fame, cabbi lor ventre a capir tanta carne, e chiaman lupi di più ingorde brame, lupi means wolves, dai boschi oltramontani a divorarne. So after this brief introduction where Ariosto is definitely talking about his present political reality while alluding at history and ancient reality and universal realities, um, Ariosto moves on and takes us back to the siege of Paris where Rodomonte has reached the palace of Charlemagne. So Charlemagne, with the help of all his generals, they finally decide to attack Rodomonte. And there's probably what I would consider the one of the best cliffhangers of the entire poem, which is at stanza number 16. The last four lines of stanza 16 are Avino, Avoglio, Ottone e Berlingero. Cun senza l'altro mai veder non posso e ferir tutti sopra a Rodomonte, e nel petto, e nei fianchi, e nella fronte. At this point, uh, Ariosto gives us this snapshot of the warriors and the knights, uh, all of them, all together at the same time, hitting Rodomonte, but then he cuts very quickly to a different scene. Canto 17 has 135 stanzas. It's very long. But it's also simple in its structure because most of it is taken by the story that is told to Griffone about the reason why this local king wants to make a big party, a big tournament. And the story is actually inspired, if not really uh, imitating almost step by step, uh, the story of the Cyclops in Homer. So after stanza 16 and 17, we return to Damasco, to the story of Griffone and Origilla, the terrible woman. In Damascus, the Griffone learns the reason for this big party, this big tournament that King Norandino has decided to give. Norandino's ships were caught in, in the winds and uh, many of his men died and the rest of the company were captured on an island by a big ogre. Norandino reached the, the cave of the ogre uh, and the ogre's wife confirmed that Lucina was still alive but kept as a prisoner by the ogre. She um, plans for a way for, for the king to join Lucina, which uh, includes uh, uh, a very Homerian, a very Odyssean way because uh, the king is going to use parts of a, of a goat to conceal himself, to conceal so that the blind ogre is not going to see him. and. He's gonna exchange him, he's gonna take him for a, for a goat. He then helps the others to escape, what, but with Lucina still captive, he's forced to stick around, to linger, and uh, until finally around stanza 64, 68, uh, 
with a deus ex machina type of intervention, Lucina is finally saved and rescued. Mandricardo is the knight that we should be thankful for this, uh, for this rescue. So Griffone prepares for the tournament in Damascus. He's a really good and uh, valuable warrior, valuable knight. And uh, in between uh, stanza 73 and 80, Ariosto goes off again, a little bit in a Dantean way, exhorting the West to reclaim the Holy Land, to go and fight in Jerusalem, instead of uh, having Christians killing other Christians. At this point in the tournament, we see that Martano, who is Origile's lover, is defeated in the joust, and he is uh, uh, he's really a coward. He is taken by uh, fear. Meanwhile, Griffone is defeating a lot of other knights. The three of them, Origille, Griffone, and the, the actual boyfriend, let's call him Martano, leave Damascus and they stop at an inn. While Griffone is sleeping, Martano steals all of his goods, and uh, especially his armor, his equipment, and he goes to King Norandino pretending to be Griffone, and uh, to benefit of all the honors and all the praises that Griffone deserved. At this point, uh, Griffone repents of his foolishness, goes back to Damascus, Norandino devises his punishment, his because Griffone is mistaken for, for Martano, and uh, finally, Martano and Origile depart, while only at the very end of the canto, Griffone is able to free himself from his captors, and that's the final cliffhanger. We don't know what happens after that moment. In stanza number 30, Ariosto describes, gives us a description of this ogre, which uh, is very colorful, and it goes like this. Non gli può comparire quanto sia lungo, si smisuratamente è tutto grosso, in luogo d'occhi di color di fungo, sotto la fronte ha due coccole d'osso. Verso di noi vien, come vi dico, lungo. Il lito e par con Monticel si è mosso. Mostra le zanne fuor, come fa il porco. A lungo il naso, il sen bavoso e sporco. Now, it's possible that, like some scholars say, this uh, character of the ogre, especially because it's a shepherd, it's a little bit of a dirty shepherd, might be a stand-in for the Pope in Ariosto's secret meaning. It's possible. <laughs> Woo. Especially because Ariosto didn't have any particular warm and fuzzy feeling for the Pope, for Julius II. It's possible. At the same time, uh, we, what we know for sure is that this uh, character of the ogre comes directly from Homer. In fact, uh, who, doesn't, uh, who doesn't remember the figure of the of Cyclops, of uh, Polyphemus? And uh, the, the way that uh, after his single eye was blinded by Odysseus, he was, he was blindly looking, looking at his uh, sheep, at his goats or whatever they were. Somebody has commented that in, stan in particular in stanzas 62 and 63, when uh, the rescue of Lucina is described by Mandricane and uh, by the King Gradasso, this rescue and this uh, saving of Lucina is uh, a little too quick. And uh, it, it shows that uh, Ariosto does not really dive into the details of, of this event. He just mentions it quickly and something very important in the narration is glossed over. But we have to note that in Orlando Innamorato by Boyardo, the previous, the prequel to Orlando Furioso, this particular scene of the rescue of Lucina was described in uh, better detail. In fact, uh, the ogre uh, fell in a hole while he was uh, chasing Mantricardo. There were many more details there that are not, they were lost basically in uh, being transposed to Orlando Furioso. Very important for Ariosto and very important uh, as a reference to Italian history for the history of Italy is stanza number 76, especially the second part of stanza 76 that I'm going to read now. O d'ogni vizio, feti da sentina, dormi, Italia embriaca, e non ti pesa, cora di questa gente, ora di quella, che già serva ti fu, sei fatta ancella. This is referring, in fact, to the fact that the Italian peninsula was, at one moment, the servant of 
a certain kind of people, another moment a servant of the other people. He was constantly, constantly conquered by different people in history. And in fact, this continued after Ariosto's uh, era as well. So it's kind of a, a destiny that happened to, to Italy to follow this type of pattern. But look how directly this Tanza 76 is referring to the introduction that Ariosto did at the very beginning of this canto. His point is not history, is not uh, God's uh, plan to create tyran uh, tyrants. That's not really what Ariosto cares about. What Ariosto cares about is his own contemporary politics. In fact, this political invective goes to the extent, in stanza number 79, that Ariosto refers, talks directly to the Pope, who between 1513 and 1521 was Leo X, the tenth, Leone X, Leo tenth, and uh, he says in stanza 79, Tu gran Leone, a cui premon le terga delle chiavi del celle gravi some, non lasciar che nel sonno si sommerga, Italia, se la man lai nelle chiome. Tu sei pastore. This means you are the shepherd. So is it a complete coincidence that the first part of the canto has been describing a dirty, horrible, huge shepherd? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We don't exactly know. <laughs> Woo. And of course, there were different popes during the time in which Ariosto kept revising Orlando Furioso, so he's not always referring to the same pope, to the same shepherd of Christianity. And it's beautiful how he uses the name Leo, that means lion, to make a, a bit of a metaphor, Ariosto, here in the second part of stanza 79, where he says, Scelto il fiero nome, perché tu ruggi, e che le braccia stenda, si che dai lupi il gregge tuo difenda. During his entire life and during his career, Ludovico Ariosto was always surrounded by wolves. He was skillful, he was intelligent enough to survive, to have his own um, profession, uh, his, his own career survive despite all the wolves that, that surrounded him. But one of the worst wolves that surrounded him was in fact uh, his own boss, in particular Ippolito d'Este. And this was also a consequence of uh, the, the political mess where Italy had uh, precipitated into, they had fallen into in this uh, period. Uh, even before Dante, in fact, if we remember from the Divine Comedy, Dante laments very much the fragmentation and the lack of, a, of an overall authority over the Italian peninsula. So this is just to say that politics were very, very important to Ariosto, and this is why they there are many references in Orlando Furioso to, to politics in general, but we have to read through it because Ariosto couldn't care less about uh, the Moors or the Saracens. Those were, like Italo Calvino says, they were fantastic characters. In fact, where his heart is, is in the Italian contemporary politics of, of his um, period of history. In any case, this was canto number 17. Please let me know if any part of this canto has impressed or hit you more than others. And let me know if you have any questions that I might try to, to answer. We'll speak soon for canto number 18. Bye.